I want to welcome everybody who's joining us on uh, live on Facebook this morning and those who will be watching this afterwards. Uh, welcome to Cross Point Church. We are continuing our, ser- our series on Messianic prophecy and the com- called The Coming King. Um, and we are in part two of our kind of, of uh, 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 sub- sub-series within the series. Oh, Children's Church. I'm sorry. Yes, those uh, Children's Church. Uh, my apologies. I didn't mention that. Sorry, my brain is on fast gear this morning, so forgive me. I will try to slow down, I promise. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're in a sub-series or a subset of a series called The Suffering Servant. This is part two today. Um, but I want to start with prayer this morning, and maybe God will slow my brain down a little bit, and we'll be able to uh, dissect what this passage has to say. Father God... Thank you, Lord, so much for all that you do. God, as we get into your word and we learn about what it means and how we can apply it, help us to focus intently on your son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So there's a guy named Robert Greenleaf, and he wrote a book on servant leadership. And he said this. He said that to lead is to go out ahead And show the way when the way may be unclear, difficult, or dangerous. It's not just walking at the head of the parade. And the one who leads effectively is likely to be stronger, more self-assured, and more resourceful than most. Because leading so often involves venturing and risking. Occasionally... Something important happens when there is no discernible leader who prompted it. But usually there are persons who take the initiative to say, let's go here or do this. Or some may lead with a subtle, inconspicuous gesture. Either way, what makes them leaders is that a significant force of people responds. Why do people respond to Jesus? Why do we follow him? Why do we worship him? This is a question we must ask ourselves. I believe that biblically, at a minimum, we follow Jesus because of the power of the servant who came to save us. The power of the servant we read in our focal passage in Isaiah chapter 49. It is the merging of the power of the lion and the sacrifice of the lamb that gives us both hope for eternity and strength for tomorrow. Our focal passage in Isaiah 49 presents us with a picture of the servant of God. And as we've been looking at what we know as the servant songs in Isaiah 40 through 53, we are starting to get a picture of what the Israelites believed the Messiah was supposed to look like. And as we continue to examine these prophetic passages, we're able to determine if Jesus of Nazareth fulfills the promise um, and is the Messiah that we should be worshiping and trusting as our Savior. So let's dig in a little bit, shall we? The context of this passage in Isaiah chapter 49. This is the second servant song in Isaiah. And like the first some qualifications of the coming Messiah are seen here. What's interesting to note about this passage is the change from first to th- from third to first person. The song we talked about last week was biographical. This one is autobiographical. The servant's talking about himself. Now, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Well, in chapters 42 through 48... The space between the two servant songs, the one we talked about last week and what we talked about this week, heightens the intensity of what's happening in Israel. It it, it gives us a better understanding of the plight of the Israelites. Chapter 48 is actually a climax of sorts, leading to the proclamation of this servant. His own testimony as to how he alone will deal with the problem. Israel is in trouble. They're in trouble. They're in rebellion. Exile is awaiting them. That's their consequence for their idolatry. But there's still hope. 
The hope comes in the form of this servant. And in this passage, the servant, the servant paints a picture of who he is and what he's going to do. Not just in the near context of the pre-exilic Israel, but in the far context of eternity. So I want to walk through this a little bit. Isaiah chapter 49. Let's look at verse 1 and let's see some of these qualifications of the servants of, it, uh, of Israel here. It says, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. So the first qualification here is that this servant is going to be called even before he was born. He was going to be called by God even before he was born. Verse 2 says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. What we see is his words are going to be powerful and sharp, like a sword or an arrow, an instrument, a weapon in some sorts, okay? That's going to cut through something. It's going to penetrate something. An arrow penetrates. A sword cuts through things and also penetrates. His words are going to do this. So this servant who's going to come is going to be speaking the very words of God to, to do what we see in verse 5. Now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, remember, called before he was born, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. So what we see is he's going, he was called before he was born, and he's going to use these powerful, sharp words to bring people back to God. To bring people back to God. In this case, in verse 5, the nation of Israel. To bring them back into right relationship with God after that exile. But we see a promise in verse 6 that is also just amazing, for us at least, okay? Where it says... It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. So that's not enough. That's not enough. That's too small of a task. You're going to do that. The servant's going to do that. But I will also make you a light for the Gentile that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So not only is he going to bring Israel back in the right relationship with God, he's going to reach out and bring Gentiles to God as well. And as Gentiles, I hope we all can appreciate that. (laughs) Okay? And what does this hope look like? That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. He will bring salvation to the lost. It's all part of this concept of of the Messiah was going to be a redeemer. That's what we see in verse 7. This is what the Lord says. The redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up, princes will see and bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. So he's going to be this redeemer that's going to bring people back in the right relationship, and one of the reasons is because he is holy. See how he says in verse 7 that he is the Redeemer, and the Holy One, which means, holy means set apart. He is different from all others. And because of this difference, and because of this redemption, and because of His words, and because of all of this, we see that kings and princes will worship Him. They will bow to Him. This is what the Messiah is going to look like. This is what the suffering servant, the one who was abhorred, will look like. This is what Israel was expecting. Now, does this match up with what we see in Jesus? Well, let's talk about this. The first thing that we see on verse 1 was that he was called by God before he was born. John 3.16, the, what used to be the most well-known verse in uh, 
in the world. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, we match this up with John 1, 1 through 2 and verse 14, and what we see is a picture of, of the Son of God being called for a purpose, to save the people. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1 through 2. He was with God in the beginning, so it was before he was born. The Word became flesh, as verse 14, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was called for purpose, the Son of God was called for purpose to bring salvation and he was going to do th- so as the very word of God made flesh. And that brings us back to verse 2, talking about how powerful and sharp his words are. Because it is this word as the very embodiment of the word of God himself becoming flesh. His words are powerful and they will penetrate into sinful man to bring that salvation. We see this in other passages in scripture. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We see it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. That sharp, double-edged sword, the Word of God itself. If you skip later into Revelation, in chapter 19, we see this picture. I saw heaven standing open, and before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages wars. He's able to judge based upon what? His word. Why? Because he's the very word of God. It's that word that divides. It's that word that judges. It's that word that sharpens. The word of God judges us. It does. His eyes are like a blazing fire. That's an image of judgment. His head are many crowns. That's an image of his kingship. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. So we know that he's talking about the same guy in John chapter 1. The Word become flesh. And now we're seeing it in Revelation. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. There's an image of purity there. And coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, said these very words. These are not popular words. And some people even forget that Jesus said them or conveniently try to forget that Jesus said these things. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Why? Because of the word of God. Jesus is the word of God, and he's, he's judging based upon God's perfect standard. And if you choose to follow Jesus, there will be those who will rebel against that same message, rebel against the same of God, and it will be divisive within families. Divisive within churches, divisive within the community, divisive, divisive. The word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is divisive by nature. Why? Because his word is as sharp as a sword. It penetrates into the hearts of sinful men and divides those who want to follow from those who want to rebel. That's the truth of scripture. It judges based upon a perfect standard of holiness. And Jesus is the, the exact embodiment of that. So whereas the word of God, the Bible itself, will divide people on issues and on, on the strength of, of what salvation means and, and all of that, Jesus himself says, that's exactly what I'm, I, I came to do. 
It's exactly what I came to do. Why? Because I'm going to present the Word of God because I am the Word of God. It's a hard teaching, but it's true. And why, why does he judge this way? Why did he come to bring a sword? Because he came, because of what verse 5 said in our focal passage, to bring people back to God. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but go with me for a second. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through 21, it says this. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. That's our call. That's, we try. Okay. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is often a sticking point as to what is the focal point of Christianity. Is it us or God? Is it man or God? Okay. But he goes on. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He reconciles us us back to God through himself. The word of God. The very word of God is what reconciles us about. This is why the helmet of salvation is part of the armor of God. Because knowledge of salvation starts first here before it enters our heart. We have to understand our own sinfulness. We have to understand our own brokenness before a holy God so that we can repent and come back into right relationship with him. Those who don't want to repent are are divided by that very word of God. And unfortunately, that's why there's a wide road and a narrow road in eternity. But those who do repent, if they are in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to through to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them and he has committed us to the message of reconciliation it's the same message that we need to be preaching to others how reconciliation happens and reconciliation with the fathers through the word of God which calls us to repent we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. How did he do that? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. The Messiah was come to bring people back to God. And he does so through his word. And he was called to do so before the beginning of time. We also know that that message in verse 6 will go to the Gentiles as well. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 35, we see a, a picture of this. It says, Now there is a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for that, that redemption, that salvation of Israel. He was waiting for that. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel 
and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and the sword will pierce your own soul too. See, even in that ministry of reconciliation of Israel, even in that ministry of, of, of light to the Gentiles, we see the nature of the sword and the piercing of the heart and soul to show us our own sinfulness because that is how, through repentance, we are brought back into right relationship with God. By repenting and putting our faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. That is it. Because truly, as we saw in verse 7, Jesus will be the Redeemer. Jesus himself said it very, very plainly. He said it this way in um, uh, John 14, 6. First of all, he's, uh, he said it himself in John 14, 6 that, um, where is it? <laughs> I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way. He's the only redemption. And, his, and salvation comes through him. We see that in John chapter 3 in the story of Nicodemus. Right? Here's what it says. Here's that story. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, and Jesus, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I mean, this is a teacher of Israel. He didn't quite grasp it. So this is what Jesus says. He says, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. You have... Sp- I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the the Son of Man must be lifted up. um, That is a, a direct correlation to him being lifted up on the cross, sacrificing himself, the gospel that comes to redemption only through Jesus Christ. that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. There's that division, that divisiveness about believing and putting your faith and trust in Christ. They stand condemned because they do not, they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone does evil, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The Messiah was to bring salvation and Jesus came and he's trying to explain to to Nicodemus that he came to do that very thing. He said that there will be some that will not follow. They will not believe the testimony. But he made that statement again that only he is the way. Verse 7 of our focal passage talked about how he would be holy And how kings would bow down to him. We see in Acts chapter 3, you disown the holy and the righteous one. This is uh, one of the early uh, passages, Peter speaking here, I believe. He says, you disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer, talking about uh, Barabbas, be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this. You disown the holy and righteous one. He's speaking about Jesus Christ. We see also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. No one, no one human person could do this because everyone is tainted by sin. But Jesus was holy. He was set apart. He was different because he had no sin, which is why he could be righteousness for us, which is why he's the only avenue of redemption. And because he is the very incarnate word of God, we see through the word of God who he was and what we are supposed to do in response to him. And ultimately, at some point in time, every knee is going to bow to him. Kings included, princes included, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and things in heaven and the things of earth and the things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, 10 through 11. What does this all mean? What does this all mean? Well, the very simple answer is it means that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. Okay, but, but you know, hopefully you all know me a little bit better than that. We're going to go a little deeper than that, all right? Okay, there's this dual theme here. Okay, in this passage of the person describing himself, that and that dual theme is one of power and of service. Okay, we see, we see both. Okay, we see this idea of I'm taking the light to the Gentiles. I'm going to be the redeemer. That's service. But we see the power as as he's powerful and sharp. He's the the, the sword and the the arrow and he's kings are going to bow to him. So we see these two things going on at play within Isaiah chapter 49. And what this means is that the Messiah, the Savior, is both. He embodies both. And I can think of no other passage that sums us better up than Revelation chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there, please. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 1 of Revelation chapter 5 says this. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice. God is the one on the throne in this prophecy here. It says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Those seals are, are, are going into later on into the, the, the judgment of the tribulation. But who can open that? Verse 4 says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So you have this image of this lion of the tribe of Judah, this this, this powerful, mighty person who can open the scroll where no one else can. The scroll of judgment upon the nations. This is what is being talked about here. And then in verse 6, we see a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb has seven horns. Now, horns is an imagery of leadership. It's an imagery of power. And it shows God's omnipotence. And seven eyes, to which he could see everything, and that shows God's omniscience which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. The seven spirits show God's omnipresence. He went and took the scroll. The slain lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was on the throne, God the Father. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense. That's worship, that's prayer. The harp embodies worship. The incense are prayers, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. Worthy. 
You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. We see the servant, the lamb of God that was slain and we see that because he was slain, he deserves worship But we see the power of the Lion of Judah because he is the only one who could wield the sword. He is the only one who could open the scroll because he is God himself. Chosen before, the Son of God chosen before to sacrifice himself. To redeem us because of our sinfulness. Here we see both the lion and the lamb, one and the same creature, the only one worthy to open the scroll, which is the revelation of judgment, and it is the title deed to eternity. And that is why we read in verse 14 these words. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. We sang it earlier and all the people said, Amen. That's why in verse 14, the elders bowed down and worshiped him. That's why they follow him. That's why we should too. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, we have opportunity to be in right relationship with God. And that is what we remember through the act of communion, which we're about to celebrate. It's also what gives us hope on this first day of Advent. So we're going to transition into our time of communion. We're going to remember the sacrifice of Jesus as he is the one who is worthy to judge us. Only God can judge me. Well, you're right, he will. Okay? So we need to make sure that we are putting our faith and trust in him because Jesus is in our righteousness. So as we transition into that, I'm going to close our live uh, feed for today. And uh, 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 we'd love to see you on Sunday if you can. Thank you for joining us, uh, you guys. And um, uh, again, we'd love to see you next week uh, uh, for service. So God bless everybody. We'll, We'll see you later.